we have seen phenomenal growth in Arizona's bioscience sector over the last 20 years. A lot of that growth is thanks to the people in this room, to the Flynn Foundation who has shepherded the Arizona's Bioscience Roadmap, which is coming up on its 20th anniversary. <laughs> to people like my friend Bob Robson, who started talking about the importance of funding and having places for the research to happen. And in 2003, um, led the drive for a half a billion dollars for university research institutes, which has created the Bio5 Institute, the Biodesign Institute. And oh, by the way, just a little side note, Oncomix Therapeutics, technology out of the ASU Biodesign Institute, um, announced its $50 million Series B closed yesterday. We need more of those. But we're not going to get more of those if we don't keep investing. Mr. Robson knows that. Um, that's why he worked with AZ Bio, and um, we got another billion dollars for university research infrastructure in 2017. But to get what we're discovering to the patient requires development. And development requires money. Now, those of you that have been in a lot of AZ Bio events um, know that um, I haven't had a science class since seventh grade. I have phenomenal mentors and teachers. And so many of you in this room have taken the time to explain the science to me over the last decade. But what I am is a trained economist. So I like to hang out with the numbers geeks. And so I brought one of my friends here today so we could have a conversation about the opportunity uh, for Arizona and importance of investing in innovation. So let me introduce my friend T. So for those of you who have not met him before, um, Jim Rounds is the founder and president of Rounds Consulting. Um, he regularly provides advice to policymakers at the state capitol, mayors throughout the state, as well as city council members, county board members, and other public and government sector leaders. Jim has delivered hundreds of economic presentations throughout Arizona and is quoted weekly in television, radio, and print media. He started his career as senior economist and senior budget analyst with the Arizona Joint Legislative Budget Committee and has been engaged in policy-related economics for more than two decades. Mr. Rounds is a senior fellow at the Goldwater Institute, a board member of the Maricopa County IDA. You and I need to talk about that and advisor to Helios Education Foundation, Achieve 60 Arizona, the Rodell Foundation, the Arizona Board of Regents, among others. Jim has a Bachelor's of Science degree and a Master's of Science degree in Economics from Arizona State University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jim Rounds. Hopefully that's the longest sentence that I'm, couple of sentences I'm gonna to have to say for the next 30 minutes. All right, so Jim, on, you know, on Wednesday the world marked the two year anniversary of SARS-CoV-2 being reported in humans. Um, these two years have brought a lot of tragedy. But we've also seen tremendous innovations. We've seen vaccines come out you know, in record time. We've seen new drugs get to patients in record time. We've seen changes to the way we do business. Um, as Arizona continues its road to recovery, what do you see ahead? We made a lot of progress, uh, especially since the Great Recession, in identifying that a lot of things make the economy tick. Uh, it's not just about one or two items. It's not just about tax policy or regulatory policy, workforce development, um, 
looking into expanding individual sectors or subsectors, where can we get a good return on investment? And we had a, a very tough recovery, but uh, Arizona and the greater Phoenix area really came out on top. This last recession, it, it was very sharp, but it was short-lived for the state, and we recovered more quickly. But what I think, what I like to think about is there's the social aspect and then there's the economic aspect. After losing a couple of really good friends to COVID, uh, I think things just hit home more when you see it, when you see a lot of people in different uh, sectors like, like uh, uh, tourism, uh, restaurants, uh, not having a job, having a hard time making ends meet. You really feel that there's more that we can do. And there's a way of doing that where you don't necessarily have to say, I'm gonna take up the Republican approach or the Democrat approach, it could be the what is the economic and good public policy approach. And it, during this time, uh, we started working on a concept for return on investment. And the reason I like that is because it crosses party lines. When you take a look at how a lot of people run their businesses, or at least the ones that stay in business, they might invest another $10,000 if it's a small company in new computers. Well, typically that would be scored as uh, income loss. But you do that because you're expecting to make that plus normal profit above that because of the productivity enhancements. We need to bring those principles into government. And we never talked about ROI at the state capitol before. And my friend Heather, uh, we were doing some work on a healthcare issue. And it was, we, the communication was difficult. So we ended up saying, okay, we're looking for $10 million for a particular project. We did a pretty detailed ROI analysis and showed that if this was treated like an economic development project, it was gonna have a positive ROI in a very short period of time, which means we're actually making money for taxpayers, which means that longer term, you can have lower tax rates and more investment, but we have to get back to thinking strategically. And so I think what this offered us is uh, a chance to take a look at what our true economic foundation is and be realistic with it and then take advantage of these opportunities. I was so impressed with the universities and uh, keeping up with them with the work that we do with the Board of Regents. Uh, it was incredible how people moved, but sometimes you have to go through tough times in order to get that momentum. I don't want to say take advantage of those tough times because I'd rather that it not have happened, but it did. So how can we benefit from that and be better going forward? I agree. And, you know, as, as we look at return on investment, so I'm going to throw out a few numbers, not too many. Um, many of these numbers you'll find in your programs. Um, over the last 20 years, the Arizona community, our governments, our philanthropists, our our commercial entities have invested over $23 billion to develop the life science industry that we have today. That's a lot of money. Wish it was in my 401k. <laughs> the interesting thing is that we were able to do an economic analysis based on 2018 numbers, which are the last Department of Labor numbers that we had available. And the return on investment, the economic impact of 23 billion invested over the course of 20 years, in one year, 2018, was 32.67 billion dollars. That's return on investment. And unlike some projects, it's also return on investment that is curing people, keeping people healthy, creating good jobs for the current and future generations. And here's the real kicker. We're at the bottom of the curve, not the top. We have nowhere to go but up. So as we look at that, we've you know, we've come a long way. We are one of 15 states that has consistently jo grown jobs, over 5,000 jobs, net new jobs. California, by the way, has not been able to consistently do that. But we have. 
Um, we are ranked now as one of the top sectors for building new bioscience and life science infrastructure. We are growing and hitting the emerging lists. We are not leading. We are making progress. Progress is not leadership. And so, Jim, what are some of the things that we need to do to actually lead? So if you think about what a leader would look at, a leader, if you're at the legislature, would look at how can I have an immediate impact and what can my impact be 10 years down the road? If you're a leader uh, in the business community, you're thinking short, mid, and long term as well. We need more of the long term thinking. And we already do this to some extent. We're, everybody's already fully bought into economic incentives where you have to put some money forward. And if it's a normal economic development deal, you would like to get that money back. So if you spend $10 million of taxpayer money, you want to get $10 million back in taxpayer money within a certain amount of time. If you're investing in something that's maybe uh, intellectual infrastructure, so the workforce training, things that we're talking about today, you want to look at 10 to 15 years. If you're investing in highways, uh, the longer term uh, infrastructure, uh, other utilities, you want to go out uh, 20 years. So we have to think a little bit longer term when we do this math, but again, these are basic business principles. Any business that has been uh, in existence for more than a handful of years utilizes these principles. But I, I think a lot of it gets back to the storytelling. I think anybody can do an economic impact analysis. And if somebody said that business Y uh, was going to make a little bit more than business X if we recruited it, uh, and the economic impact was $700 million, is that good? I don't know. It, you'd have to actually analyze it to figure out if that's a good number. What's the tax impact? But if you also explain that, let's not just look at the basic numbers. Let's explain how a lot of these individuals at this new company are going to be starting their own companies down the road as well. You get this additional benefit that no economic impact analyses pick up. Ours does. But they, that can really add to the economic benefits. And then you talk about how when you have training programs with new businesses coming in, that's almost free workforce training that individuals can use at that business and they'll be able to expand in other places. So if we think longer term, I think that'll be a big deal. And then we have to get into individual topics. My, my, the, the greatest opportunity I feel in the country is in Arizona but we have to achieve that by really maximizing what we invest in for the rest of this decade. And if we can do it in the right places, if we can pick individual topics. So you can't run a bill at the Capitol and say, I want stuff better. You know, line one, uh, and then two, let's create a committee to evaluate if stuff got better after five years. You actually have to pick individual topics. And so when you're talking about workforce and academic stuff, there's, there's like going to be a push for dual enrollment uh, in high school and at, at the college level to expand it. I love that because that would be one of the easiest assignments for me to monetize because that has a guaranteed positive ROI for a number of different reasons. Those types of analysis we need for some of these bigger picture investments. But you, you got to tell the right story and get people interested. I, I was so excited when we thought we had an opportunity for the immunology, virology, and biodefense to try to get together with certain groups and establish a $20 billion industry in the state that would give the state general fund an extra half a billion dollars a year every year to spend on other investments. And it's so hard to pull these together. In that particular case, I think we have some uh, momentum from Phoenix and also University of Arizona as an anchor. And now if we can add to that, I think we'll have an opportunity. But I, sh I already completed a lot of the math. It doesn't matter. You have to get people motivated. They have to think that it's something worthwhile to work on. And it has to be something where they feel like they can partly own. So, so much of it, I'd like to say it all depends on the quality of the econometric equation. It doesn't. You have to do the math so you can make the other decisions and tell the story, and then everybody has to be on board with it. But what great opportunities. We're not maximizing any of these right now, and we're already a leading state in many economic categories. 
we're one of the few that is that top five state that isn't full pedal to the uh, metal in terms of trying to accelerate further. And that's where I think we need to go. Well, you know, and it's interesting as we look at um, some of the decisions that we made 20 years ago that are catalyzing or were the catalyst to the growth that we see today. And um, we lost Jane and Terry Hall almost two years ago now. Um, as a matter of fact, the Easy Bio Awards where we honored Jane was the last time she was seen in public. Um, but her work on Education 2000, which most of us now just call Prop 301, created the Technology Research Initiative Fund, which has now put, I think the latest numbers I saw was $1.4 billion into university talent over the course of 20 years. Interestingly, Massachusetts, um, over the same course of time, also invested $1.4 billion via the Mass Life Sciences Center. They've seen a much bigger return on their investment than we have. And if you use the metric of venture capital, okay, they're a 20x our venture capital, just in Boston. So we've built the research infrastructure. We have phenomenal healthcare delivery infrastructure. How do we bridge that gap so that we can have more oncomixes bringing in $50 million at a pop? The, the TRIP is a great example of uh, bad news, good news. Uh, the bad news is a colleague of mine at one of the universities asked if I could review their last TRIF document. I took a lot of time and I told them at the end of reviewing it, um, if I was a lawmaker, I would be wondering why I should be investing in this. And I, I read it thoroughly. But I also said, you've got to go through and tell a better story. You have to have the science component, you have to explain why people are benefiting, and you have to do a better, a better job monetizing it. And so while you just covered why this is a fantastic program, one of the things holding it back is not so much the hard stuff, it's what I think is the easy stuff that can just get cumbersome. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're talking with the Board of Regents about possibly doing a little bit more of an economic analysis for each of the individual university projects so that you can have a main TRIF document so you don't want it to be over complicated. But then if we can have the supplement and then we have the group explain it, I think there'll be more momentum because most lawmakers don't know about it. But I w I'm somebody that very much supports higher ed investment, everything you all do. And in reading that, I, I had to be honest, I was very disappointed because it convinced me that maybe this could be done by the private, private sector and it can't. But isn't this a great example of how some very easy fixes might convert the messaging and the acceptance among, again, these things can cross the aisle. And you and I talked about the fact that I had the same thing. You know, if, if I get a 20, 30, 60 page report, I'm gonna read it because I read reports. The general public does not. And so one of the things that we started in 2020 was a website called Faces of Triff, which is facesoftriff.org. This is not maintained by the Board of Regents or it's, it's AZ Bio started this, and it's all stories. It's stories about the amazing work that's being done by researchers at our universities because of TRIF. And we also found that we're not doing a good job of telling the story to the general public. Those are the voters that vote for these things. And so um, our friends at ABC worked with us to do um, Celebrating Life in Science when we couldn't do the AZ Bio Awards in person. That first year, the late night portion of that, we had more people watch that one hour television special than had attended every AZ Bio Awards program in the history of AZ Bio in one night. So we learned from that and now we have health innovation spotlights where we are sharing the story of a health challenge and an Arizona innovator who's working on that challenge 
in one minute blips on the morning news, the evening news, during prime time. And in the last six months, we've reached 1.6, I just got the new number, million Arizonans with those stories. Because they need to know what we know, which is what you do. So venture capital, I want to get back to that. Because you and I have talked about the fact that and at the university people, some of you are going to not like what I say next. Um, so what get measures gets done. We are measuring our universities and specifically our tech transfer agency offices on the number of patents they put out. And secondly, on the number of spin out companies they have. So I'm a mom. So the analogy is I can have as many kids as my body will be able to pump out. I will pat them on the back and say, congratulations, you're all grown out, up, and then kick them out of the house so they can starve. That's what we do with our startup companies in Arizona. And I see a number of heads nodding in the room. Those of you that are gardeners, what happens if you don't feed and water your garden? Nothing grows. So what we're seeing is our universities are pushing these companies out too soon. They're not, there's no funding in the community for that very early, very risky startup. And so they either bump along the bottom until their IP is too old to be invested in, or they die. That's the reality of life in a, in a venture capital desert. How do we fix that? I, I can't answer how to fix it, but I like the example because you identified something very specific. And we ran into this with workforce training where a lot of uh, individuals were um, being tracked for maybe three months if they stayed in the job that uh, the, the government entity helped them get. And when I asked, well, what happened a year down the road, we don't know. Why is it that women, and especially women with kids, are, are dropping out at a higher rate or not staying? Uh, well, sometimes if you identify it, a lot of it was uh, they had jobs, they had to take care of their kids after school, or they didn't have a vehicle. Bus pass would have taken care of that. It cost very little. But you have to actually identify a problem and you, again, not everything is rocket science. I, sh I should say bioscience, because that's more advanced than rock rocket science. But not everything is bioscience in terms of the complexity. So, so what you're talking about is, here's a specific problem. How can we fix it? And you'd be surprised how over a lunch, get four, no more 40-person committees. Get a handful of people that can influence others and try to figure out what is the specific problem, and then you have your to-do list. So a strategic plan, which is very popular in government, often says, you know, here's our mission, we're gonna try to do good stuff. A to-do list is, Bill in Cubicle 7 is gonna give us the report by October, and by November, we're gonna have our early policy ideas for the legislative session, and then we're gonna try to sell it by January, and then we're gonna have a bill the next, uh, 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 the next uh, month. We need more to-do lists. But exactly what you said, we need to break it down. And that's the only way to make change. Uh, think about just trying to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to develop a program where I'm gonna cure eight diseases all with the same medicine. And you're trying to mix everything together. No, you have to focus. You have to focus in public policy and economics and you gotta tell the right story. But you have to have the story. You have to have that list of, here's all the stuff I'd like to see fixed. And then you go through and figure out what is it gonna take. Some of the stuff's gonna cost money. Some of it's gonna cost political capital. If it costs money, try to figure out what the benefit's gonna be and then you can tell people, not only is this gonna help in a number of areas, but you're gonna have a 10 to one ROI within 15 years. That's how you get individual items done. We just need to start stacking up these smaller items. So as you know, I have a small item. It's Christmas, everybody. So I used to ask for ponies. 
I don't need a pony anymore. But what I do want to see is that we catalyze and grow the next generation of life science companies here in Arizona. And we were very lucky to have a family office out of New York who worked with us for three years and we went all over the country and even to some places overseas and looked at innovation centers. And we mapped what they had and we mapped what we had to determine what we need. We also looked at what was working and what was not working. And we looked at St. Louis where Bill Danforth and John McDonald, so Ralston Purina and McDonald Douglas, they used their personal wealth to create an investment fund called the Biogenerator. And little St. Louis is doing better than Phoenix in venture capital. I, I, I like what you said. Even after the Great Recession, we had to do a report uh, for Kirk Adams in the House on where we stood in terms of our economic foundation. And I had us rank 50th in the country because we only had one economic development program and it was a workforce training program. And before we could pu uh, publish the final version, that got swept, so we had nothing. Um, but we didn't make recommendations on a bunch of new stuff uh, that no one's thought of. We took a look at every other state and looked at some key economic development programs. So we didn't reinvent the wheel, but we brought a lot of different wheels back to the state. So in a lot of these cases, I like that. You build off what other people have done successfully, and then you try to match it with why it was successful. There could be a program that's very successful in another state, but for different reasons. But if we can pick the right topics and programs that would be a good match here and build on our current economic base, it'll be hugely successful. But once you do that, if you can also say, and this effort is going to generate $20 million a year in tax revenue, and we only need $5 million to get this kicked off, then you get your $5 million. And I think that people have to strike pretty quickly because there's a lot of grant money that people forget sometimes that it's our tax money, came out of our wallets, your wallets. I want it spent in the right areas where it's efficient. We need to be a little bit more careful with how we're gonna spend any remaining tax monies because we're gonna have a pretty hefty bill down the road with what's being spent um, in Washington. So let's maximize that so we can mitigate that harm. But the only way to do it is to advance our economy. We need more high wage jobs. So remember I said I want just a little something for Christmas. So Santa baby, I want $200 million. And I'm not kidding. So AZ Advances is built on a three-year best practices study to determine what it would take to catalyze the next generation of life sciences here in Arizona. With the concept of taking that $200 million, putting it into an endowment, which would then yield $10 million per year to invest in early stage companies in the life sciences in Arizona forever. And thanks to our friends at the IRS. Yes, I did put friend and IRS in the same sentence. We will be able to hold the equity of investing in those companies, which is different than what the public-private partnerships at ACA and others are allowed to do. So we would hold that within the nonprofit endowment. And then when James Bates's company, AdvyNow, becomes the next unicorn from Arizona, from my voice to God's ears, right, James? Coming soon. Coming soon. When that happens, if there's equity from James's company in that endowment, the endowment gets bigger. So it becomes a growing entity. Now, we invest about $10 million a year into the Arizona Commerce Authority, and they do great work, and we are thankful for the work that they do. But every year, we have to come up with another $10 million. If we had used this model 
20 years ago, we would never have to put money in the Arizona Commerce Authority again. Think about that. Because we do have some things that are coming. Economists look at this pattern of population. Okay? I am the last year of the baby boom. You guys are going to be taking care of me for a very long time. Now, luckily, um, Gen X, which is, they're the problem children, which this industry caused the problem. Did you know that? Okay. Gen X is 30% smaller than the baby boom because the life science industry came up with the birth control pill. And women had choice, and they had their children later. And therefore, we had a dip in the population until it started to catch up. Gen Y is bigger than the baby boom. But during that dip, we're going to have trouble paying for old folks like me. Well, it'll be easier to pay, not necessarily based on volume, population count, but how productive are those individuals? It gets back to productivity. That's why workforce is one of the most fundamental concepts in terms of moving the economy <clears throat> forward. So. You could have an individual, you could have one individual instead of two, but if their productivity is triple, you, you have to kind of look at those net gains. And so I'm still hopeful, but it's very difficult, again, to explain these productivity issues. It, it, when, if somebody said, what are the most basic fundamentals in economics? Most people would say supply and demand. It's productivity. That went back to Plato talking about uh, whoever, what little group he had, uh, and they were talking about how you better your life by increasing productivity, and they were talking about basically economic issues before any economists were around. It's productivity. How do you get there? You have to invest in these individuals. You have to invest in the economy. You have to come up with ways of having individual productivity enhancements. You have to have business productivity enhancements. And so the economy as a whole really is a true public-private partnership, mm -hmm. just in a different way. Uh, but it, just for some quick stats, Again, optimistic about Arizona more than any other state, but it's difficult to say that we're doing everything properly if among all of our economic development uh, competitors, we're last in terms of per capita personal income as a percent of the U.S. We're last in terms of average wages converted for cost of living and everything else. We're last in terms of gross state product per person. We used to be higher. Greater Phoenix area used to be above 100% uh, of the U.S. average, it's dipped. But I'm optimistic because we're, we still are growing these great industries, and I feel like we're barely even trying at this point. And the numbers are starting to curve up. What we do the, next, the rest of the decade is going to determine if we start that upward trajectory or if it ends up being a little bit of a blip. And, you know, sometimes we have great ideas, and I had this conversation with, with Senator Gallen, um, Science Foundation of Arizona was a great idea. We had some problems with implementation and then we lost the funding for it. Interestingly, when Science Foundation was still going, there was a group of leaders that came from Utah to study what Arizona was doing with Science Foundation. We defunded it, they funded it, and now they are double our venture capital number. And um, ASU just put out a number of a billion dollars invested in Skysong Innovation companies since the start of Skysong Innovations. Um, Utah had more than that invested in their U-Star companies in one year. One year. So we have to do things out of the box. We have to be consistent with what we do if we're going to realize our promise because we have made phenomenal progress. It is time for us to lead. And the only way we will lead is if we come together to do that. Jim? Yeah, I, I think we need more people banging their fists on the podiums at the Capitol in different meetings, um, just having a stronger presence. And it, it, we have to, but at the same time, this is why you have to be very strategic and do the right storytelling. 
even though you could roll in and say, here's a project that's gonna have the best ROI that you're gonna see of anything else that's being considered, you're still asking for maybe $20 million or $200 million. And, well, that'd be grant money, but say, say you wanted $20 million from the general fund. They're not necessarily gonna say, here's my 15, 20 year return. They're gonna say, I can either fund this 20 million or I, uh, this project at 20 million or something else. And those something else items, even though they might not have the best long-term economic benefits, because it's now, is something that politicians have to pay attention to. So in a way, it's not so much the politicians' fault, because they have a lot of other uh, issues that they have to deal with. We have to give them the right stories. We have to give them, like, like when we were uh, brainstorming with uh, uh, Heather Carter, it was, Here's the math in such a way where all we, the, the core of it was to show that these two upward sloping lines crossed by year eight and it was less than we thought it was gonna be and the ROI was gonna be humongous. No one cared about the detailed analysis that went into it, but they responded to something simple like that. But we had to do that because that 10 million, I think it was, was competing with uh, other project at the same time. So it is difficult, but right now, again, getting back to the grant opportunities, these are one-time monies. But if you can convert them into ongoing benefits for the economy, then that creates ongoing revenues that can be reinvested much like a business would. So I love all of the, the different topics that we talk about, but if we could just kick it up a little bit on that storytelling and bringing in what the, the, the real co uh, conditions in politics and public policy formation, I think you'll be very, very successful because we need to raise our incomes. Those statistics that I'm talking about are real, you can't dispute those, but we're doing well and look at this opportunity. We really should try to get something done in the next year and then we'll also have the following year with some of the leftover monies before the federal government has some major uh, financial problems that they'll have to deal with before they have major financial problems? Well, the good thing about the federal government is they can pretend they don't exist. At the state level, you have to balance your budget, so you actually have to acknowledge them. All right. So the other thing that I've learned, and we're, we're coming to a close on this, is remember when Jim said, you know, more people have to go to the Capitol and they have to bang down the table. It's really important that you be visible and that you show up. Now we're all busy. So with AZ Advances, I'm gonna give you all homework. This is not the first time I've given you all homework. Um, but please go to azadvances.org and check it out. Equally important, between now and the end of the year, please make a donation. I'm not gonna tell you how much it has to be. Now, if you're independently wealthy like Jude LaCava, okay, six figures would be nice, Jude. Um, but some of the most meaningful gifts that we've received were from students that were five or ten dollars. But what I really want from you is your company logo or your picture to go with that donation on the donor wall so that when we go and have those conversations at the legislature, they see real Arizona companies are behind this. Real Arizona people are behind this. Real Arizona families are behind this. If you go on, you'll see our chairman of the board, Kirsten Swingle, her family picture is on that donor wall. This is something where every single one of us can be part of creating life-changing and life-saving innovations. Even if you're not a life science rock star like Stephen Johnston. You knew I was gonna do it to you sooner or later. Okay. Who is working to eradicate cancer? Eradicate it like smallpox. We need more Stephen Johnsons. We need more James Bateses. Okay. We need to see more companies like Onco Mix get to the stage where they attract $50 million at a pop. 
And that won't happen if we don't fix some of these foundational issues. So that's your homework. Okay, go to azadvances.org. It's on the back of your program. And make a donation and send me a picture so that the leaders in Arizona know that this is not just Joan's crazy ass idea. This will change the trajectory of our state. And in the case of some of the things that people in this room are working on, it could change the health of mankind. So that's what I want for Christmas. <laughs> and a puppy. <laughs> You want to bring us home? I, I just needed a good heat gun that I just broke. So <laughs> I think I'll have a chance of getting my, oh, I, I like everything that was said. In fact, if you aggregate everything that's been discussed, if you aggregate it properly, you have your prospectus. You basically need a business prospectus for attracting money, not just from members, but from outside. And really it's just assembling it in the right way and telling the right story. But the core is there just what is that prospectus and it'll be a little different depending on the group but i see great things from you uh, coming in the next several years this is a time to take advantage of this self-reflection that we talked about at the very beginning uh, after covid you go through a tough time but i, I appreciate being here I, I, it's an honor to to, to be at a, such a prestigious uh, uh, group and thank you very much thank you jim